Well, hello. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Todd Weidemann. I'm in the games industry since I left school. Um, and I thought I would share some of the experiences I had in the 35 years, which are still valid today. Um, and uh, basically to ruin the day of what I call old farts. You know, the people who are in this industry forever, uh, and they're saying, oh, old times were better. Well, they weren't. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here so that you feel happy to be in the modern times. Um, just quickly who I am. Uh, as I said, I left school, started developing games as a hobby. Um, we sold our first game in 1984, 1985. My first professional job was 1987. Um, I was an artist, a programmer, um, development director. That was my first professional job. You see my beautiful picture here from 89 with my first really expensive computer I bought for my own money. Uh, and yes, I'm Apple fan since 1985 and have been until today. Sorry for that. Um, I founded my own studio in 1996. Um, we did uh, a title, which I'm going to mention in a second, um, and we had a successful exit with that studio, uh, which was exciting back then. We were the first studio in Germany to have a worldwide publishing deal, which was really hard back then. That's something you don't remember. You can publish worldwide without leaving your office. We couldn't. Um, And uh, after that, I was CEO of a public listed company. So that basically was the end of my career because you can't go higher, right? Um, after that, I started consulting in my passion, which is online games, which also included the free-to-play business model. And most people wanted to know, hey, how do I make money with games I'm giving out free? That was the start. That was 15 years ago. So I'm doing free-to-play for 15 years. Um, I'm creative director of Stratosphere Games uh, for five years for my own project, which I'm going to show you in a second. Yes, a little bit advertising has to be here, but there's a special occasion for that. Um, but I'm still freelancing, consulting, free-to-play for major companies. Um, most major companies I have worked for, Supercell, Rovio, Jagex, Ubisoft, whatever you name, uh, they were my clients at some point. Um, but the most exciting time, what we have now is that I'm launching a game I have been heavily involved with very, very soon. It's out in Germany, Scandinavia, and Canada already. And the worldwide release is like, I can tell you the date, I'm not allowed to, but it's like, yeah. okay, so <laughs> there you go. Um, and yes, you might wonder, uh, this is a, a hardcore sci-fi MMO RTS. Will that work on mobile? Five years ago, when we pitched the title, everybody said, nah, core games will never work on mobile. Well, now they actually have a different opinion. Um, and uh, so far, our numbers are really nice, so we are happy. Um, and uh, we're going back to that product for just one minute in, in kind of a couple of slides. So, how was it back in the 80s? When we developed games, one programmer. Sometimes the programmer was also the artist, and there's a sound. We had a game where, a hit game, which we actually published called Turrican, where one guy did everything. Everything. Yeah, I know, it's like famous now. <laughs> it's just one guy who did everything, right? And this game, what my best friend did, I did the art and level design. Yeah, I was a really good artist, right? But hey, the glass bubbles were really hard to do back then. Anyway, um, And we sold that for 25,000 Deutschmarks. That was a fortune for us. We were students, basically. But for the publisher, it was nothing. <clears throat> it was sold for 49 Deutschmarks, which would be equal like 49 Euro today. Um, and they sold a couple of 10,000 units, so they made a fortune with it. We were happy, they were happy. But basically, that title was my entry into the industry because that publisher asked me, hey, do you have more than this title? And yeah, I brought them Tarik and Katakis and a lot of other titles, which Germany was known for back in the old days. But you can see, two, three people, very cheap. Guess how long we took for this game? It was a hobby, right? Like three months it was done. Basically, development time was measured in months, not years. So very, very quick turnaround. My first commercial title I developed with my own company was Panzerlite. Um, we did basically a research, market research what was missing in the market. Um, and there were a lot of flight simulations out there. This was like the, the highest quality um, fame game you could do of flight simulations. But the competition was really, really fierce. So we said, hey, why not do a tank simulation? There were literally none. And this was the title we actually then sold. Uh, we were only seven people. Um, we had a couple of freelancers on top. But nevertheless, it was an expensive product. You know, it cost more than half a million Deutschmarks, which was like really expensive back then. Today, 
some people, some companies have like a payroll of half a million a month, right? So, so that was the difference. But nevertheless, uh, we shift the title. Um, it retailed for 89, like nearly twice as much as the other one, because this was like the, the, the high end tier of games you could sell. Um, only American games sold for wo uh, over 100, by the way, like all the Ultimas and God knows what imported from the US costed like 119, 149. You know, Dita knows he bought them all. Um, <laughs> Easier. Um, and what also was typical for companies back then is that I was CEO, producer, and designer of the game, all rolled into one. So we were all jack of all trades. We did all multiple jobs. There were no specialists who only did one thing. It didn't exist. Um, we sold 120,000 copies back then, which was considered to be a big hit, um, simply because the market was different back then, right? The scaling was different. Today, Many, many games would not even break even with 120,000 sales. <clears throat> then there was a story that we had to buy the rights back, relaunch a title because the publisher went broke and that went broke again. And you know, whatever happened, we sold another quarter of a million copies, which made this one of the most successful titles back then for me. Um, the funny thing is that this title had a shelf life of 10 years. So after 10 years, you could still find that title at MediaMarkt. And that got me thinking, you know, why did that title survive that long? Although it looked really, really old back then, um, but the others didn't. But we will come back to that at the end of the presentation because that's a really important learning for you guys. So the next big hit you might uh, uh, remember I worked on is Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Um, I was consulting Ubisoft back then and the studio in Annecy, Ubisoft asked me, hey, can you help us with what they call post-launch monetization. So how can we make money after someone bought the game? That was basically my job. Um, so I helped them monetize that, but if you see the budget of this game was over 100 million uh, dollars or euros, doesn't matter, it's a lot of money. There were three and a half thousand people working on it over the development time. That's like the largest team I've ever worked with. There's a YouTube video where you can see all the credits of this game and you have to wait for 12 minutes until my name scrolls by. <laughs> but still, hey, I have the game in my CV, right? So it makes a mark, but nevertheless, oh well. But here you see some of the frustration, right? When you work in a team with seven people, you have the feeling that you can actually move things. It's part of you. You know, you claim some of the fame of the game. Now in this one, <laughs> you're one of three and a half thousand. How can you say, I made Assassin's Creed. Well, you can't anymore. So the only one who can claim is Ubisoft. <coughs> but nevertheless, 15 million copies is like the scale games were selling 10 years later. But note that this is like ten, plus 10 years, plus 10 years, you know, roughly. Um, if you add 10 years to 2013 or nine years, we're in 2022, which is the current title I'm working on. We, are, we started the title with seven people. We are now over 20 on this one. It's a mobile title, cross plat you know, Android, all, all the rest. Um, the budget, I can't tell. But uh, if you know three, three years development time times 20 people, you should be able to calculate how expensive this game is. Um, I'm the creative director, not in an art sense, but in terms of design. So the all high level direction, vision of the game uh, is on my plate. Um, and uh, all the other people are basically, you know, adding to the quality of the whole game. Um, we have a lot of Homeworld fans in the team, of course, otherwise it won't be Homeworld. It's a 20 year old IP, which is another important fact. Why the heck do we do in a Homeworld game? No one knows this IP anymore. Hands up, who knows Homeworld? I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so um, we soft launched in the multiple territories. We were really happy about the KPIs, especially on spot what, what we forecasted here. Um, and this is another important point from the experience we have. The expected lifetime of this game, if the game just works okay, is 10 years. So this game will exist for 10 years and we have to service it for 10 years, which is exciting, right? Because we can actually do that. We couldn't do that back then in the old times because the technology were just too fast. <clears throat> and you see here, this is a chart I found on the internet until 2017, how the team sizes grew, like, you know, single 10 guys, five, 16, and then a couple of hundred. Um, and that adds a lot of complexity to our game industry. Um, we need middle management, we need a couple of producers. You know, on Assassin's Creed, we had 32 producers on it. There was a producer who was only responsible for NPCs. 
We had a, a, a producer only responsible for NPC anim animation. There was a producer only responsible for the animation of the main character. And that kind of makes it difficult to develop these large titles. And I envy companies like Ubisoft who can produce a title across 16 studios with 3,000 people and still ship that damn thing. I mean, who in the world can actually manage that? That's really hard. If everybody is in one office, you know, like 20 people, that's easy. And that's what we call what the good old times were. We had control. We could shift things from today to tomorrow. With a title like Assassin's Creed, to shift that title is extremely hard. <clears throat> and you see that on some of the titles who have been in development for an eternity. You know what title I'm talking about? There are many. Hmm? Skull, and Skull and Bones from Ubisoft. There's a Starship Citizen. There's whatever. You know, there are many, many titles which have a difficulty to actually finish that stuff. <clears throat> so... What also happened, and that's for me the most amazing thing, which actually pushed our industry forward, is that when mobile shipped and the whole industry was turned upside down, there were a lot of very small companies, you might call them indies, triple I, whatever you call them, who actually <coughs> created top hits. Without these titles, our gaming world wouldn't be like what it is now, right? Like Minecraft. A single guy did this. Yeah, he was experienced. Nevertheless, a single guy created that monster, which is now worth a billion a year. Um, the uh, last day on Earth, which was actually the reason when I started to believe that hardcore games on mobile works. Because that game is now four or five years old. I don't remember. Anyone knows? I don't know. And I got numbers from this title, and they did like a couple of millions a month. And and another company who hired me did a robot fighting game and they did a couple of million a month. And I said, oh, Core is here. So I went to publishers and said, hey, Hardcore is here. You know, it's viable on mobile. And they say, nah, we want a match three. Okay, now we're back. Did you know that Call of Duty on mobile makes more money than all of other Call of Duty titles together? Yay, it's important. Um, other things, Stardew Valley, you know, Last Day on Earth, Valheim, Minecraft, and many more. And... Most of the new genres we have were invented by smaller studios, like survival, like MOBA. MOBA was not invented by League of Legends, by Riot. It was invented by two modders of, uh, of Warcraft 3. You know that. <clears throat> so there's a, a big shift, and the question is, why can they do that, and why can't Electronic Arts invent a new genre? Why can't they do that? Right? And there are reasons for this. So the key learning here and I have to say this, in the games industry, size doesn't matter. Um, simply, if you stay lean and mean, and you have a small studio, you can enter risks the bigger studios are not allowed to enter. Ubisoft could not get a couple of hundred people together and create a risky product, because failure is too expensive. Now, with a small team, you can. And that's the reason why all the creative pushes we are getting are coming from the smaller teams and the, and the smaller um, uh, companies. <clears throat> and that's, that's a very important point. So we are basically fooling, uh, turning back full circle to where, where we were in the beginning. Like in the 80s, one, two, three-man teams, and then it was like maybe 10 people, but we could do whatever we wanted because games were so cheap to develop. Like three people for three, four, five months, nothing. Okay, <clears throat> so at some point we, we broke the industry because there were publishers selling trash in bags, how they call it. So whatever software they found, they called game, they put into a box with a nice cover and put it on the, on the shelf. And it sold, right? So they made business with that. But in the long run, you know, the whole thing failed. That was when the home computers died, if you remember. <clears throat> the PC took over. Another... Historical thing is what happens to genres. Some genres refuse to die or refuse to change. Some genres appear new, like survival or whatever we call them, battle royale. And some genres do die. And the question is, why did that happen? <clears throat> so the, the first trend which we have since I'm in the industry is that when there's a new hit coming up, there are hundreds of companies who want to follow. 
We have seen this, right? We have seen this back then with Space Invaders, if you remember that. You know, there were hundreds of 2D shooters coming out. And Asia had hundreds of arcade machines, and we did shooters. Everybody did 2D shooters, right? Then the so-called maze games. So it was the first time when you actually, you know, could navigate a maze properly. And there were techno technically limited, but nevertheless, hundreds of clones. Adventures. You remember the, the big comment between Sierra and Lucasfilm. You know, Indiana Jones against King's Quest, stuff like that. Um, and there were many companies trying to follow that trend. But Adventures were a really special case because it was a limited market worldwide. It was very big in certain European countries in the US, but nowhere else. And that Bakey killed it. And actually, it was replaced by 3D Adventures at, them, at that point. So Bakey Tomb Raider killed Adventures. That is what happened to that genre. Then we had the flight and other simulations. When we shipped our Panzer Lead, our tank game, you remember, 1989, at that Christmas, there were over 32 flight simulations being released. 32. That's like 30 too many. And that basically killed the whole simulation genre. After that, it went downstairs. And no, no one developed flight simulations anymore. <clears throat> A couple of years later, Microsoft did you know, flight simulator and train simulator, but that's it. Becky, it got killed. <clears throat> Same with platformers, Doom likes. When uh, when these companies released how ray casting was done, if you remember that time, you know everybody suddenly did you know Doom clones. There were hundreds of them coming, and basically you know, there's just one or two games who can survive, maybe three. All the rest is basically you know for nothing. Um, and that's a big learning that you should not do that. Um, the same with MMOs when the MMO market exploded, and then came World of Warcraft and. Many people try to mimic whatever that is, and suddenly in the West, all MMOs died. There were many of them, but suddenly, bam, it was gone. And the funny thing is that when they all died, the agents actually grew because this is all they play, MMOs, and they tried to make them viable here in the West, and they failed, which was good. But that knowledge, how to do MMOs, was kind of lost because it was diluted among the whole industry. But guess what's like, most mobile games, what do they need? They need MMO online game design. And that knowledge has been lost. But the funny thing is it's on the internet, but people are too lazy to Google, but oh well. <coughs> you remember when Facebook had the number one spot in terms of share on market for Facebook games? Everybody played them and then bam, it got killed. Bakey Mobile killed them, right? Um, we have been there, and many people tried Facebook games. It was really hard. There was, there was um, one or two years where this was like a gold mine, and then it was harder, 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 and then bam, it exploded. Um, mobile casual, like, hands up, who was part of a team doing a Met 3? Come on, one, two. Who did a Met 3 title in his career? Okay, who has success with that? See, the, this is this is an okay one. C congratulations, but you're not Pixonic, right? No, okay. Um, because Met Three came from Facebook um, and it was really popular on mobile, ma many of them tried to beat Candy Crush Saga. But is that a viable goal for you to do? You know, can we beat Candy Crush? Actually, it's really really hard unless you understand the audience. And most of you, what I see here, is not the audience. We call the audience for Candy Crush the board housewife. And you have to understand what that means in order to give her something else she wants to play. And most, most people didn't get this. And the only competitor they have, they discovered their competition that they're successful by accident. It was not planned. It wasn't. <clears throat> so, MOBA, same thing. You know, League of Legends. How many League of Legends clones are actually surviving? There, there's Dota, there's League of Legends. What else is there? Yeah, none survived. And there are reasons for that, right? Everybody, oh, let's do a League of Legends on mobile, you know, and bam, they, they got killed. They, you know, the, the only game which is successful is actually League of Legends by their owner Tencent, where they basically made an adaption of that. And then Riot was pissed off and they did their own League of Legends on mobile, which is like a rivaling themselves. So they can compete themselves, but whatever, you know, they, there's nothing else. And I, I'm giving you a really good slide in the next one. <coughs> Battle Royale, the same thing. Um, when Battle Royale came up, or it was called Survival back then, it was in the charts on Steam number one for five years, and no one was competing them. 
not Electronic Arts, not Activision, no one touched survival. They didn't understand it. And they said, nah, you know, who want to play this? Hey, it's number one in Steam charts for years. And the game was called DayZ. You remember that? And suddenly someone woke up and did Ark Survival. And then there was a third one, I forgot the name. You know, and, and then the, the guy who did DayZ left the company because they fought over whatever. You know, and he did said, okay, let's make another survival game called PUBG. And bam, it's like the best-selling game of all time. Um, still, do you know any survival game from Electronic Arts? No. Activision? No. See? They just didn't get what was happening there. And all, most other battle royales actually died. Most. Not some of them. Loot shooters is the next big thing, if you haven't heard. Many, many Asian companies doing loot shooters, many European companies doing loot shooters. Just in Europe, I counted 12 loot shooters on top quality being developed, plus US, USA, plus 30 being developed in Asia. Tencent develops 12 loot shooters at once. And they will kill all of them, but the one who performs. That's how big loot shooters will be. And if you do a, a loot shooter now, hurry up. <laughs> Just saying. You know, oh, and the next big thing is uh, PvPVE. This is something which has been lying around. You know who invented this? What's the biggest title of this? It's the Russian one. Pardon? Yes, Escape from Tarkov. So Escape from Tarkov was a surprise hit, a sleeper. Not many companies realized how big that is. Tencent wanted to buy the company and they said, no, fuck off. Um, they can afford it. <clears throat> But now, you know, they're trying to do the same thing on mobile and other uh, PC. Anyway, this is just an example of genres where, you know, this kind of high boss there, many were following and many bridges were burned. So the lesson here is don't do that. Don't follow the big hype unless you're really fast. So let's, uh, let's make a really small case study, you know, League of Legends. Um, you know the history, you know, it was a, a Warcraft 3 mod, then came League of Legends with Dota around. The two designers who did the mod, I think they actually did one or the other. Then came Success and then the many, many clones and the Death Trial. The problem with League of Legends is that it only works when you do it exactly like League of Legends did. It's very, very hard to break that concept. If you make, instead of three lanes, you're making five, you fail. If you try to make random maps, you fail. If you try to, you know, whatever, the concept doesn't work otherwise. This is like the problem of it. And the other problem with League of Legends is the more complex it is, the more successful you are. So if you try to do a League of Legends for casuals, you will fail. And this is the death trail of a lot of MOBAs, at least the ones I could find. You know, email me once, you, you, this is not on the list. But there are some really expensive products on this, um, and they're all dead. And the only survivor is Dota and League of Legends. <clears throat> so, so the key learning here is that you should learn new data. And with that, what I mean is that the, your genre you're in, your competitors you're in, and not only from today, but historically. Like five years ago, which was number one in our genre and their competitors, and why did one or the other fail? This is a key learning you have to do because your audience is still there. It's just five years older. So you can imagine, you know, if you played any genre five years ago, you might still play it today. And this is still your audience. So you have to learn why they failed. Um, you, you should not, unless you're fast, follow genre trends. Like there's this big genre coming up and you're saying, ah, oh, yes, let's jump on this train. No, the Asians are always faster. You know, Tencent's biggest development studio has 20,000 employees. And they once asked them to kill a competitor, and they did put all 20,000 on three identical products, basically, and the one who performed better, they released. It took them six months. The competitor was dead. You know, that's how they can do it. So don't try to compete with this. It's really hard. Um, what I usually recommend is that if there's like this huge following going this direction, oh, we are all doing survival games, you know, there are a lot of other genres being abandoned. You go there. Because a genre might get abandoned, but the player isn't. The players are still there. So there are a lot of markets out there underfed by the specifically genre. So you can measure genre trends, and whenever there's a genre trend laying dormant, this is something you can pick up, right? Um, You can find genre trends on other platforms. My favorite platform to look for genre trends for hidden gems, for blue oceans, 
when I'm talking about mobile games, right, is on the Switch. I look at Nintendo Switch and their games and they're saying, that doesn't exist on mobile yet, but it's a huge shit on Switch. And then I ask myself, why? And then I go deeper. Maybe it's not compatible with mobile, maybe you cannot transform it correct, but you know, this is one way of doing it. Okay. This chart, I love it, you should Google for it. <clears throat> it shows the, the game's revenue size of platforms all the way from the beginning to the end. And it's very, very interesting because it shows you a couple of things. First thing, the PC market is actually not that much bigger today than it was like 1990. Meaning that if you're doing a PC game, your audience size didn't change much. The market changed, but the audience size didn't. The same with consoles, by the way. Look at that. Consoles, the market... It's, it's not stagnant, but you know, it's still a big size of what we're used to, but it's not that sexy anymore like it was. You know, this was the golden age here. This is where you made a lot of money. But here it's really hard, specifically now with all the Game Pass stuff around and so on. Console is really a tough business today. And th this is the, the one which Becky destroyed it all, right? From this point here, it doubled the market size, which is mobile. <clears throat> So just with this chart, you can see that there will be changes coming. Because if you're running a business and the only thing you understand is money and investment and size and you don't have any idea what games are and you look at that, guess which market you go first? Where the biggest is? Oh, mobile. And that has consequences. That has consequences which we all will feel as a gamer and maybe you as a development company depending what you're up to. <laughs> The next thing which changed, which was like two years ago, maybe three years ago, is that before that event happened, we, when we said, hey, we have a budget, we want to make a game, the first thing we said is what platform should it be on? Because the platform dictated the techni technical requirements, the design freedom, memory size, the business model, a lot of things were dictated by the platform, correct? And the design had to fit all that. So the first thing was the platform, then we did the market analysis, does that fit and so on, and then actually the game was developed. That changed rapidly two or three years ago because now platform moves second. It doesn't matter anymore. So you design your universe first and your game and then you go to all platforms. And here's the proof, right? Genshin Impact, Fortnite, Diablo, they all go cross-platform with a huge success. This is where the big games will go. And guess what? Where in the future, games, new IPs will be launched first. On mobile. Meaning that on PC and console, you're left with ports, with conversions. You remember the time when you had a platform and the major launch was on console and then it was ported on PC and the port was really, really bad on PC? We still had that with all this Dark Souls stuff and so on, you know, which was really like odd ports. That will happen soon because the first wave of a new game will be on mobile and then console and PC. And that will happen really soon. And this is already in full shift because this is old, right? This is like a couple of years old. So all the major publishers are working on this. So, and it's being made easy by the new freedom you guys have, right? <clears throat> so the key lesson here is that when you design a game, you should, if possible, keep the design platform agnostic, like that. You can change platform at any time. Don't make it dependent on something. Make the interface layer kind of, you know, isolated from the game itself. Make sure you have controller support, touch support, and all of that, which is not that easy to do, but nevertheless, you know, it's a very important learning here to do that because there will be new opportunities. Who knows what new platform we are playing on in five years? Ten years ago, no one said, oh, I'm going to play Call of Duty on my phone. And everybody said, no, you're crazy. No, he wasn't. Right, And if I tell you now, oh, we might actually play the next games, you know, in the air, what I mean is with, with AR glasses on top, and you can actually, you know, play, not virtual reality, that crap, I mean AR, you will say, yeah, that's crazy, but who knows, maybe someone invents something so cool that you can actually jump into your game right away without that VR blinding thing. We'll see. Keep your game in a way that you can port on another platform very easily and adapt it very fast. 
that will keep your company alive. Speaking about technology, in the early days when we developed that game, we spent half of our budget in tech. Half of it. We de developed our own 3D software renderer. And then 3D hardware came around and we had to adapt to that, right? But half of the budget came into technology. And this is something which was, is a very typical attribute of most games developed in the 80s and in the, in the 90s. And look at that, right? Our resolution of the game was smaller than the icon on the iPhone. This is where we made games inside. And today you're talking about, oh, 4K, I don't know if that's enough. Mm, well, hmm. 16 to 256 colors, yeah, the old times. Very, very limited. And we had to work around all these limits, correct? I mean, the poor artists who had to draw a face in 16 colors. And one of them was black and white, the other one was ugly pink. Hmm. Good luck. This is how our games looked like 20 years ago. Today, you have the freedom of choice. You have, a, you have turnkey solutions of most critical technology paths. Server client, renderer, Unity, Unreal, Playfab, however they're called, you know, you can pick them up and have turnkey solutions and enable you to deliver your game faster without um, doing your own tech. This is pure luxury. This is the power for you to enhance the speed of your game idea to the market. But this is something you have to leverage because you want to test your game against the market. I'm going to um, go back to that in a second. But although it reduces budget and time, it makes you... Maybe you're going in bad with that technology company. Let's say you're using Playfab as your backend. And at some point, Microsoft decides to stop the service because they don't care about it anymore. And you're saying, uh, but my game still relies on it, so what do you do? What happens if Unity is sold to Tencent and Tencent shuts it down? You're fucked. <laughs> Who has a source code license of Unity? Hands up. He cared. He did the right move. All you did not. So there is a contract with Unity you can do is that in case of uh, ownership control change, you're getting access to the source of the version you used. Try to do that if you have a game as a service. Otherwise, you have to shut down your game. Right? And it happened already. You know, Amazon bought the Playfab competitor. It was called... Um, GameSparks. Game thank you. They bought GameSparks and they fucked it up. So all games relying on GameSparks are now basically zombies in the App Store. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so what, what is the next topic I have here? You guys have technology helping you to go to market fast. We didn't have that. There's a new technology coming up in lightning speed with exponential growth, which will help you even faster to go to the market. And we are talking now about AI. AI had such a huge shift in advancement this year. You know that most technology grows exponential, right? And in the beginning, AI was, meh, 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 but now AI is like in this tunnel. Like every month, we have something new, which is amazing. Look at that. Someone threw the pixel art of Fallout 2 into AI, and the AI said, oh, this is how he looks, she looks like. No human hand touched this graphic. The same with this one, or this one. And that's even more exciting stuff, right? So all voiceovers, all voiceovers in all languages can be done by AI. Much cheaper, better, faster than hiring voice actors. They're really, really good. You cannot distinguish the voice from a human voice. With annotation, just everything. Just throw them the Bible and they will really read it like a rock star. They can do that. Animation. You know, I have seen an AI module where you put in a skeleton of a, of a, of a male, thing and you just said heavy night whatever and suddenly that guy went moving because ai said so no animator was touching it right the textures ai concept art ai by the way if you if you look at this um, uh, the software it threw you this house in 20 different styles on screen and said which one you like more in a second same thing with realistic humans Right? The epic thing, you saw that, and there are many other things uh, helping that. So basically, AI will help you creating content faster, because this is what holds us up, right? Let's say you're doing a cyberpunk world in the year 2077, you know, how many artists do you need to actually populate the city? And it, you know, a lot of them. But now these artists can control their creativity with AI and accelerate to that point. 
that's exciting because again you can go faster to market so the key learning here is actually the contrary you like be patient so whenever you run into a problem that holds you up which puts friction in your development be patient someone noticed there's friction and will develop a solution for that and there's one out there all the time <clears throat> so technology which we use in the gaming industry always is like top notch but it sometimes takes a little bit until it's actually ready and usable. I remember when we shipped our first MMOs, we had to develop our own server client code. We had to ship physical hardware to a server provider and basically put them into the rack and install that and turn it on. So our scaling was really slow because we were depending on the delivery times of servers to the warehouse, uh, to the server rack. Today, cloud, one button push, and you've got new servers. Or it auto scales, right? You got a million users tomorrow, bam, Amazon helps or Google or Asia or whatever you're using. Back then it was more difficult. Again, a solution came up which helped us scale. <clears throat> Next thing is our market, right? I don't know if you remember, but in, back in the old times when you bought a game for $49, you went to the, the store, picked up the, the, the package and bought it. You had to deduct VAT. You had to deduct retail fees, logistics, license fees, and publisher fees. And from that, you as a developer got like a couple of percent. And that usually was four or five bucks. That was what you got back then. So that 120,000 Panzer lead we sold times four was close to 500,000, which was lower than the budget, so I never saw any royalty. Basically, in my career, and I shipped hundreds of titles, over 100, I lost count. I have never, ever gotten a single penny of royalty. That's how great that is, right? Huh, frustrating. Anyway, today the business model, most of that is, it's free. You only have to deduct VAT and platform fees, which is Apple, Google, whatever you're on, Steam, even charter stuff, um, and you keep the rest, which is much higher than before. And even if you have a 50-50 split deal with the publisher, which is currently the norm if you're not hiding in the bushes, um, you know, it's much, much more than before. That means that you can sell much less copies than we had in the old times and still be profitable. Because the whole supply chain cost is actually lower now. And the reach is bigger because you're essentially distributing your games for free. The other thing which is important, what you have today, which is pure luxury, is what I call market transparency. Back then, in the 80s and 90s, the knowledge about the markets was exclusive to publishers, and they didn't spread it. So to find out what sells and what doesn't was really, really hard. So this was one of the only services back then called NPD, um, which sold numbers like that for US retail. And it was really hard to get them, like $25,000. Back then it was a fortune, you know, to actually get these reports. And publishers didn't share that, none at all. So what do you do today when you want to see, hey, how does this game perform? You know, you just Google it. So you go in here, you know, and there are many, you know, Sensor Tower and how they're all called, which basically gives you data for free. You don't even need to, an, an account. Uh, the latest one, which I really like here, is AppMagic.rocks, um, because they, they give you the LTV by tier. It's awesome. Yeah, write that down. Very good. And you can actually Google that for free, meaning that one title you can actually look at. And they show you the percentage of the, the revenue by territory. So when you're doing a game and you find similar ones in the App Store, you can see which territories should matter most for you. Knowledge for free, which is the coolest thing, right? What, what you are expected, um, uh, RPPU is all of that. But here's the thing. If you have listened to some of my previous talks, learn how to read data. There are many, many pitfalls you can enter when you read data wrong. And if you do conclusions on wrong reads, you're fucked. So please, you know, learn how to read data professionally or hire a professional to actually do that. Another thing which we can do, which is actually was kind of hidden for a while, but now everybody is doing it because of free-to-play, is you can read data inside your game and see what the player does. This here is a heat map of one of the Assassin's Creed titles where Ubisoft measured where people were going inside every level. So they could modify and enhance their level design to better have control of the player how they experience the world. That's something they did for a long time. 
and not many were doing it back then, but now we can. So you can measure the quality of your game, which should entertain the player, you know, with data inside. We have that now because every single game is online. Everyone. And God knows what we shouted out when they introduced DRM, that everybody, every game has to be on to get played. God, we are nearly on a strike, right? No, they were right. <clears throat> Here's another thing, which is, I think they said that story, I can tell this. Because Ubisoft was the first one to introduce DRM, you know, everybody pointed the finger, hey, Ubisoft is the bad boy, right? So EA said, oh, Ubisoft, you did this. But EA said, we're doing the same, but no one is caring because, you know, everybody was playing Ubisoft. Why did Ubisoft do this? Because they found out that for every original copy they sold of Assassin's Creed, there were 14 pirate copies being played. And they only measured players who played the game for eight hours or more. So you cannot say, ah, oh, this is just a guy who went into the game for an hour and then deleted it. No, no, no. Intensively played. One to 14 so the industry was forced to introduce DRM because of piracy. Now piracy is totally gone because everybody needs an account to log into games, right? Which is okay. <clears throat> All piracy is really cool because the game is free anyway. Hmm? So, hmm, yeah, I know. So let, let me go. I only have 10 minutes. And the problem is with 35 years of learning, it's really hard to pick the ones who still matter today and that you can actually learn something from that. Um, so I just made a quick list. On top of the stuff I already talked about, right? <clears throat> These are the mistakes I have seen for 30 years. And they're still being done today. So the first is following the charts. What game should we do next? Oh, look in the top 10. Oh, we're doing something like that. Big mistake. You can't compete. Simple as that. Or creating a game the audience currently plays. Like you pick an audience which is like, oh, I want to have the shooter audience and we're addressing that with the new shooter and you're basically creating a game they already play. Or you ask the audience what type of game you want to play, they're usually telling you exactly what the game they currently like and you're basically making a, a clone, which is not good. So don't do that. <clears throat> but you should know your audience, of course. Or creating a game exclusively which the publisher or the stakeholder wants. Who have been there as a stakeholder wanted a particular game and it failed brutally, but you had to do it? <laughs> yeah. So there are many, many parts of that, right? The worst, the worst one is the investor who says, but my son says your game sucks. I have heard that three times in my career. Okay. <clears throat> or make a game only you love. Now, there's a contradiction here, right? You remember Stardew Valley was basically done by a single guy who really loved that genre and did this and so on. There are exceptions to that, but usually you're on the wrong side of the business when you do that. Or making a 90% variant of an existing title. You know, identify what you can basically take from a title and offer enough new things that is different, but have the stuff they love still in the game. This is a hard dual at sword you have to walk. It's not easy to do that. <clears throat> Making a game without knowing your audience this is a very typical one, because we all have assumptions who play our game, but most of us don't know. Well, if you go to your competitor and ask them, hey, what's your average age? You know, they might tell you. Yeah, many of them are nice people, specifically on a conference. You know, you can walk up to them and say, hey, you know, oh yeah, we have 50% females in our game. And you're like, what? What game I'm talking about, which is very surprising. Huh? <laughs> now, there's a League of Legends adaption from Tencent, which has 50% female, which completely threw me off the tracks. I couldn't believe the world. I said, nah, this is a game for males 26 years old. No, 50% females in the game. That's Pretty cool. And then I found the solution where they basically said, yeah, but we have 50% females in Asia. I said, ah, okay, that's different. <clears throat> and not verifying your game versus an audience early. Here's the trick. You make many assumptions, your game is playable, like the first demo prototype, test it in the audience. This is so important, and not many of you guys are doing it still. We had our first prototype out, and we put focus group tests on it to actually test if we're on the right track or not. So please, please, please do that. Don't hide in a closet for a year and then be surprised that no one wants to play your game. You should not do that. Another thing which is typical, which I find still today, when, you know, hey, audit this developer, you know, what do, uh, are they doing wrong? They're basically underestimating what I call the 50-50 rule. Half of your game, okay, up to 80% of your game takes half your time and the last 20% of your game takes the other half of the time. So basically you're slowing down to a crawl at the end 
because things are getting slower. And because this is so frustrating and so expensive, the last 20%, many people ship with an 8% game. That's basically what Free2Play did, right? They basically shipped early and then and did the last 20% on the community because they got the data to correct it, right? But the whole thing also led to an upside-down development model where every single feature is only developed up to 20% and then shipped and see if it works and then enhanced to the rest. Because the faster you have the feedback that it doesn't work, the cheaper it is. So up to 20%, hey, that works roughly, okay, let's see if it works. And then you go there, okay, now we can actually go full speed with the feature. And if it doesn't work, you say, yeah, okay, forget it. Not many co companies can do that, though. <clears throat> Jumping on hype tech too soon. Yeah, I'm writing VR and NFT here. Who's doing NFT game, games, Web3, hands up? You're kidding me. Really? Oh, I'm, I'm in such a good country here. This is so awesome. <laughs> okay. I know there are a lot of talks, but you know, you will, you'll, you'll see in the next slide what I think personally about NFT. Um, <laughs> never ever sell your IP. Never. The reason is, today, games are living for a decade. There are games being dug out who, have, who are 20 years old and they're making a remake and making good business. Most of my IPs are now owned by THQ Nordic or you know, the Swedish guy, um, and they're making business with the IPs which are 20 years old. You know, I didn't own them. You know, they were sold because the company went broke and God knows where they ended up. And that's a shame because your IP is the thing which keeps your world living. Don't do that. Never. Whatever the publisher says, you know, shared IP usage. They can use it for seven years and then it falls back to you. This is all good, but never sell your IP. And this is like the hardest part where I had problems like when I started the consulting career is that people don't listen. Um, you, you go to your client and you say, listen, this is wrong. You should do it like this because this will happen, blah, 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 etc. And they're like, oh, thank you for telling us. They're still going on. And I'm like... Why didn't you listen? And they said, yeah, we thought, mm -hmm, ba, 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 whatever they said. And that was frustrating because I just wanted their best, right? Save time. I said, I did this mistake 10 years ago. Don't. I tell them what will happen. So what I learned is that you, you have to tell them. They realize it. Okay, so do their thing. And then they're running into the wall with their mistake. Bam. And they said, oh, what the fuck happened? Oh, remember Toit said? Oh, that's why. Okay, so we have to fix it. So the baby, you have to let them do their own mistake. It's like trying to teach your kid that the oven is hot. You can tell them 20 times they still will touch it because they have to learn themselves. It's the same thing. And usually it takes three turns, three mistakes in order to, you know, that they're learning. And that's the same thing with when I transfer knowledge in my free-to-play talks or when I'm with my clients, right? I give them basically the base to learn upon so that they say so one step. So they basically go over the first step to try to find out what the mistake is initially. Very quickly, myths will never die. The PC market will die. I have heard that every five years, I don't know why this is a cycle, every five years they are saying, oh, the PC market will die. No, it won't. It will stay like it is, and you saw the charts. Um, that technology XYZ will actually take over the world. And that's completely wrong because technology actually works like this. This is proven by economists. You know, you have like this excitement phase here and then, you know, it goes up and then actually it kind of has diminishing returns. NFT is just here. So it will die and go back after three or four, four years, it will be back. Oh, NFT is now much better. It might, but you know, only here it's actually business. The same happened with VR. May I introduce you a VR goggle from 1990. It's a tube they have in front of their eyes. We have been there. We did all that. You know, motion sickness. We have researchers from professors and scientists, you know, why that happens and stuff. And they're still trying to solve it. Hmm. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. VR is baking in the second circle. So the third one will come around soon. <clears throat> that crypto and NFT will take over games. No, they won't. Uh, metaverse will take over the world. No, they won't. Baking, the metaverse is having problems which the MMO crowd researched 20 years ago. Oh, we can't display 1,000 people in their avatar costumes all at once on screen. Oh, really? <laughs> we noticed that in World of Warcraft, you know? Um, so, 
don't believe the metaverse is like in phase one, they're down here as well. Um, so a small outlook and then, I know, one minute. <laughs> so I predict mobile games will be the primary launch platform for the next couple of years. So the next Call of Duty might launch on mobile first. Um, with the platform moving second, it might hurt the weakest link. And unfortunately, that's a PC. So the PC might get hurt a little, but as usual, the PC finds something no other platform has and saves itself. That was the case back then. We, we got 3D hardware, we got CD-ROM, we got internet, lots of stuff the PC invented, you know, and the console, it took 10 years to adapt. But nevertheless, the PC might get hurt because the platform moves second. The AI will optimize your production in ways you have never imagined. That means you will need an AI engineer soon. So better hire them now because next year they will be all gone. Because everybody needs them. So better hire them now because at the moment they're cheap. Um, that our market growth isn't over yet. Just Germany grew with 13% last year. Just Germany. And the whole world is growing. The gaming market is not at its end yet. We are, we are, not, we are not at the diminishing return yet. We are still growing. Um, all publishers will continue to consolidate. EA Activision, you remember the rumor that Amazon want to buy Electronic Arts? Hmm? Oh, please do this and kill it. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You will lose entities to the car industry. The car industry is no longer building cars. They're building computers on wheels and they need your people, specifically, specifically engineers who can kind of core program and UI designers, UI programmers. So keep them hidden that the car industry won't find them, okay? The good news is when they go to the car industry, they will return because it's boring as fuck. <laughs> okay, so every, every time you lose someone to BMW, Mercedes, tell them, whenever you're bored, come back. We will welcome you back with open arms. Tell them after years they will be back. But nevertheless, this will happen. Okay, that's basically my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you th thank you that you hit this? You should read this. <laughs> okay, if it's too, too small back there, it says, I'm waiting for this game more than sex with my girlfriend. Um, yeah, I had to copy this. You can <laughs> um, so the game will be really, really soon. I'm open for questions, two or three. Uh, here are my contact details. If you want to either hire me as a free-to-play consultant, have stupid questions, or say, nah, toy, you weren't right. You know, I love feedback like that, and, you know, argue about stuff. Just so. You want his girlfriend's number? This is, <laughs> the, you know, he, Magellan1701, you can actually contact him on Twitter. <laughs> okay, you should call him next weekend, okay? <laughs> okay, and I, and I don't have his phone number, but you have his name, you can contact him. Hey, if your girlfriend is bored, give me your number. That's okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. So we are so such very there's so many talented developers making games. And how what would you be advice for for a developer that's making his game that is making something that will be a success and not talking okay, about no huge success that he's gonna sell many copies, but a success that will allow him to survive on making games. So how what what would be your country is for knowing that we make something that's gonna allow him to live? It the thing is that there's data out there, what is the minimum sales on Steam? Let's say you make a PC game of your passion and you do it alone, maybe with a friend. You have the median sales on Steam, you can find that out, it's very easy in the internet and you, you know that, oh, roughly we sell 20,000 copies times whatever share you get on your price and this is making your development budget. Anything higher is okay, everything lower, ah, you know, that's hard. Um, I, I don't advise against doing that. Right, doing a game of your passion, but try to build it on the community. Make an early access as early as possible. Listen to these people and develop it with this. There have been games in early access for years on Steam. When they came out, bam, they sold a million. Um, so you know, d don't dug in out of the world. You know, let people in. And yeah, it's hard. You have to listen to them, even if they say, "Ah, this is a pile of shit." That's a hard part. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Yeah, you're all hungry. Thank you.